Hello, Christ is in our midst. I'm Father Kevin Long of St. Elias, Antioch and Orthodox Church in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Today is Monday, July 11th, 2022. And here are the readings for today. The first reading is St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Brethren, working together with him, we entreat you not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he said, At the acceptable time I have listened to you and helped you on the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God we commend ourselves in every way. Through great endurance and inflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watching, hunger. By purity, knowledge, forbearance, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness, the right hand and for the right hand and for the left, in honor and in dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and not yet killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet make many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. In today's gospel reading is from the gospel of St. Luke chapter thirty or chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. At that time, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at table. Behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was at table with the Pharisee, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair on her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, What is it, teacher? And our Lord said, A certain woman, or excuse me, a certain creditor had two debtors, one owed five hundred denarii and the other fifty. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. And which of them will love him the more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, to whom he has forgave more. He said to him, You have judged rightly. And then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house, and yet you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. She gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. He did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she has loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, And who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee. So today in the Orthodox Church, we have many different saints that we commemorate. One of them, if you look over my shoulder, it's kind of hard to see because of the glare in the mirror there, but you see the icon of Saint Sophroni, the Athenite of Essex. Essex is a town in England, right there. That's Saint Sophroni. So Saint Sophroni is a modern day saint, only canonized just a couple of years ago, but recognized for a number of different things. The first is the founding of his monastery in Essex. The second is his promotion of the sanctity of Saint Silouan of Essex. Saint Silouan was his spiritual father, and in many ways Saint Sophroni was Saint Silouan's only spiritual child. In addition to that, He's known, St. Sophroni is, for his remarkable talks on love and on love for the other, especially. In his monastery, there were several practices. If they were not able to keep a rigid cycle of prayer, if their spiritual sight, insights were not deep enough, he would have them instead serve the tables like deacons were originally ordained for. But he made a special point to tell them to do nothing to scandalize the visitors. And by that, scandalizing is an interesting word. 
But by this, we don't mean do something that is so weird that it makes them wonder. But instead, don't embarrass them. Don't put them on the spot. Don't make them feel inferior. Don't make them feel like somehow they're less than everyone else. And that's what he means by scandalizing. So St. Sophroni would teach how to be hum humble in the midst of everything. He was very grateful to England, especially the English government, for their allowing him to create this monastery on their home territory. Because if you remember, in the English world, the Anglican church is the church of the government. So for them to allow him to build a monastery, especially when he did in the 50s and 60s, is really remarkable. It's very gracious. Anyway, so with St. Sophrony, we also have someone who started his life um, taught and guided by a very pious nanny, but then going off on his own, doing pretty much what he wanted, living the, the bohemian life. He sought after the wisdom of the East, and by the East, I don't mean Eastern Orthodox, I mean the Eastern mysticism of Buddhism, Hinduism, and um, things like that. Um, and so he... He did continue his journeys there. He discovered that, that ultimately, especially in the Eastern studies that he was doing, when one accomplishes their goal, they dissolve into nothing. And then he compared that with the Christian God, where we dissolve, we lose all of our personal selfishness. But instead of dissolving into nothing, we dissolve into authentic personhood. We become whole. We become complete persons in the presence of our God. Each person then has their intrinsic value with God, and each person then is fully realized into their personhood. Sin is dissolved, selfishness is obliterated, and what remains is the perfect self, the one that was created, intentionally created at the time of Adam and Eve before they fell. And then we have, through grace, what God has given us in the hope of eternal life. So true personhood is only realized in Christ. So St. Sophroni then teaches those kinds of things. He teaches the importance of humble love. He teaches the importance of the emptying of Christ, the, the inverted pyramid that he talks about, where the Christ is at the very pinnacle, which is at the bottom in terms of the power structure, he perfectly releases his own desire for power so that through him all things might be saved because even though he shows that he has willingly given up all of this power, yet he is still able to destroy death by his death, obliterate the kingdom of the dead that the devil had rule over, and bringing all of those and hopefully us into that, again, authentic personhood united in him in the heavenly kingdom. So that's, in a nutshell, aspects of the teachings of St. Siloam. Another thing that he did in his monastery is he had two rules. The first rule was the practice of the divine liturgy, which was celebrated as often as was possible within the walls of the monastery. It doesn't mean that it was happening every day, but it happened as frequently as possible. And then the second is the rule of the Jesus prayer where when you are not there in, in the liturgy and you're doing your normal work, the Jesus prayer is first and foremost on your lips, in your head, and in your heart. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. That prayer is said over and over and over again in the monastery and amongst all of the monks and nuns who live at that monastery as they continue on with their work. One last comment. St. Sophrony was also an artist of great ability. And so there are icons that he has done. You see his icons as evidenced in the monastery in Essex, St. John, um, the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, England. Um, there is a book about his um, iconography, and it shows not just his great abilities as uh, an artist, but it also shows his great theological prowess in that he understands that icons, when they're truly written, are a combination, not just of art, but also of theology. The geom geometry of the icon tells a story. The colors used of the icon tell a story. The placement of each thing in the icon tells a story. 
in each one of those he understood deeply and intimately. And so God blessed Saint Sophroni with all of these gifts and he took them and he turned them back to God to receive the glory. And we give thanks to God for the example of Saint Sophroni and so many people who were influenced by him throughout the world. And may God bless and keep you and those that, be, that you love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Thank you very much for joining me today. I pray you have a great day, and God willing, we'll see you tomorrow.